But I do want to, you know, Kareem, I was on Revolutionary Blackout Network and he said something, you know, he's been trying to, Dr. Kareem over at RBN, frequent guest, he's been saying this to me, you know, for me and Nick and others to get together and talk about our stories. I think it's a great idea. What got us into this struggle? What got us into race, racism, anti-capitalism, socialism, anti-imperialism? And so I'll end it, you know, I'll give you a few minutes just to let you know how I got here. Uh, because I think it's useful to review even for me. And I think Madeleine Albright's death got me thinking about this even more so because I was a young child. And at that time of Albright's death was probably, I mean, it was a really turbulent time in my childhood, a really rough period of my childhood. And so I, I mean, first of all, I didn't become a politicized person. I had a lot of anger, right? A lot of anger that I kind of kept in. I still do this and I need to, that's why I've been in therapy for, uh, uh, what year is it? 2022? <laughs> Long time. Um, but I had a lot of anger as a child that I didn't know where to put it. So I would put it, you know, I would, it would just throw it back to me. And that's what a lot of people do. It's totally normal, but it is what it is. So, and I didn't really understand why, right? I didn't understand why. I knew there were a lot of things that upset me. I knew there were a lot of stuff that I wish I didn't go through. But nonetheless, you know, we all have these stories, I think, especially in this moment of capitalism and decline. So when I heard that Albright died and I started reviewing what was going on in Yugoslavia, thinking about the Clinton administration, I grew up in that time. I grew up in that time. That's when I started to gain at least, you know, the, the years, right? Early adolescence, pre-adolescence. It's when you start to learn that the world outside exists. It's not just you and your caregivers or whatnot, right? If we're going to go into theories of childhood development, right? It's like when we're young, 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 we just, we can't see the world outside, even if it's happening to us, right? Which is what's so tragic about the young children who are taken by sanctions, starvation from sanctions, bombing campaigns, right? They don't understand what's going on. They don't understand why their neighborhoods are being blasted to smithereens or why they can't eat. It just happens. So, you know, when I was young around that time, late 90s, right, I, you know, my family was going through a really difficult time. Uh, there was a lot of mental illness on my parents' side, and my father was working a lot of hours to make up for what was, you know, an extreme spending spree on the side, you know, that, that occurred due to mental health issues. And this also was happening around the time, right, that NATO bombing was happening during the deregulation of Wall Street the elimination of glass steagall and so yeah we uh, my father was a federal worker he you know he's a union worker so his wage was decent for i guess just the neoliberal era but uh, by this time you know credit and debt was just becoming such a a staple of working class life. And uh, yeah, I'll always remember that time as being one that was super, just super difficult because we had, you know, because of all the debt that was incurred, because of the way that they prey on you, right? My, I mean, my parents and, and mostly on uh, one side was spending a lot of money, right? It's kind of like in this euphoria, this mania, a lot of money, blowing what little savings we had, uh, compiling debt, the creditors and the, the credit card companies, Biden's people, they were on a rampage to accumulate all this massive debt from working people and, you know, people who were vulnerable. And that's what they did. That's what happened to me. And so we risked losing the home. We had to refinance several times just to keep it and have a little bit of equity to use to spend in other areas, right? Because it was massive, there was just a massive shortage of income to pay for basic things. And there was a real worry that we would not be able to keep this three family 
three family house, very small. I lived in a very small apartment, very old home, one that was very affordable to purchase. Uh, my dad was a um, he was a veteran, so he was drafted in Vietnam, was a beneficiary of the GI Bill. So he was able to buy a home once he did get a federal job. It took him a while. Once he was able to get one, he was able to purchase a home for relatively cheap and get a, a, a favorable loan. That was a lot of what the GI Bill was. But with neoliberalism, a lot of that came back. A lot of that was taken away. And so there was a lot of strife. I mean, I'll never, I, I was, we were up. I was up, they would call late hours, early hours, right? Looking, debt collectors, looking, looking. It was very, very stressful, you know, not to mention living in a house of mental illness. It was stressful. Um, and then, of course, there was the racism piece that made me very angry because I grew up in a diverse, quote unquote, community, a working class community. And racism was just part of the language. It was just part of the experience, If whether you were hurling it or whether you were experiencing or whether you were doing both because it was just that embedded in daily life like it is for most people everywhere in america that's why i don't get the deniers it's not that important uh, you kind of grew up right talking about it thinking about it and it was really part of my experience a lot of anti-asian racism was just so prevalent right? The war jokes, the jokes about uh, Vietnamese and tunnels, about quote unquote gooks and chinks and all of that was just part of my daily life. It's how people understood me so much to the point where I remember around this time too, right? 10, 11, 12, I was like trying to lie because I have like this mixed race background and say like, I'm from, I don't know. I like picked a part of the map. I was like, I'm from Greece, right? That's how sh much shame I had about my quote unquote identity about my uh, national background and you know my mother's side is vietnamese and she was not really open to talking about her background and comes from i think a pretty uh, right-wing political background that emigrated during the liberation struggle before the big 75 i believe it was like 73 or so when she came so before the big seven 1975 mass migration she came with her family and then ended up splitting off going to university right getting support from the government and then she was like 17 at boston university and that's where she met my dad out there my dad was like i don't know fumigating cockroaches and stuff he was like a low wage uh, pest control person when they met and then he worked like sweeping up the coop bookstore before he got his federal job so um but that's how they met. They met in Boston. They didn't meet in Vietnam, like a lot of people assume, just because he was drafted and went during after Tet from like, I think it was like 70 to 71, 69 to 71. And yeah, no, I just had a lot of anger from all those experiences, right? The financial hardship, the anti-Asian racism, the you know, mental illness in the family. There was just a lot of stuff going on. I just didn't understand it. So I just poured everything into whatever, whether it was competing in the school, competing in basketball. I just like poured all of my energy into those things. And uh, it, you know, it, it eventually wasn't satisfactory because I burned out, especially with basketball. I just like burned the hell out. I was like, damn, this is challenging. A lot of pressure. I just wasn't jiving with the, like the ultra competitiveness, the toxic competitiveness uh, of organized basketball. And so you know, it just never, it, it just never really clicked for me, even though I love, I love the game still. And I, and I love, I loved it then. I, I still do love it. It's just, you know, the way that uh, the culture is in this toxic parasitic society. I just, I eventually just had to quit, at least in that level. And so I was very lost after that time. I was in college. I was at this like upper elite institution because I thought I had to go. I was uh, dating someone in high school who was very like a high achiever, really wanted. And I was I was a relative high achiever. Like I got good grades, but I didn't think anything of that. That was just like an exercise for me. Oh yeah, I can I can get good grades. I can you know, I was always looking at the next person, right? I was always looking next to me as like, oh, I need to meet their standards, right? So I was always competing against 
one of my friends or whatever to like, you know, get good grades, but it never really clicked about college, even though my sister was going to college, my older sister, I really wasn't that motivated for the experience of college. And I think that was because my senior and junior year were just incredibly difficult years for me, right? Incredibly difficult years. So I wasn't really thinking about it. And then I ended up just applying to a bunch of schools, got into one elite elite quote unquote uh especially in price school and that's where i ended up and it was uh skidmore college i was there and it was a really difficult experience a lot of wall street types a lot of wealthy uh, capitalist types and i can tell you that it was that experience right seeing that like class the cl nature of class just up in my face that started to propel me right i still only had this like race only analysis because that had been my language growing up as a child and then it had been the dominant politics in this kind of like bourgeois way right this really like academic identity politics so i i fell into that to begin but then it just wasn't satisfactory it wasn't explaining power I was I was feeling powerless to change things. I felt like everyone was trying to con me into thinking that things would change, even though we were merely just talking. So I had a professor who was like, look, get into the class struggle, even though he was a liberal or whatever. He was just like, look, this country has a history of class struggle in the labor movement. So uh, check it out. And he placed me in contact with a program in New York City, the union semester program. I did that for a semester burnt out because Occupy Wall Street was happening. The internship was not a good internship, even though it was an interesting struggle, the Sotheby's lockout. Uh, but I didn't know how to plug into that. It was really hard to know how to plug into something as just an intern student outside of the labor movement. They didn't have much for me to do. I didn't know how to insert myself. I wasn't an experienced activist. I just didn't have that yet. So that happened. That was disappointing. Occupy Wall Street taught me a lot, though, about politics. I met a lot of communists, anarchists, socialists. We would talk. I was very skeptical of all of them at the time. I was just like, I don't know where I fit on this spectrum. And I would just watch and analyze and see how their strategic conversations and then their efforts would bear fruit and try to understand why certain things didn't work, right? So there was this one example I remember, I'll always remember, of an organizer who wanted to go to, and I was dating actually someone who lived in this area, uh, Broadway Junction, which is in East New York, Brooklyn, very poor, very black neighborhood. And I was dating someone who lived very close to that area, so I was familiar with it. and. I remember this white kind of Occupy Wall Street, kind of on the Democratic Party spectrum, was just like, we're going to go to Broadway Junction and, and organize the poor folks who are there. We're going to merge our movements together and we're going to go to that train station. We're going to get this big showing. And, and I was just like, you and your white middle class friends are going to go to a train station and just scream about and say why... They need to join your movement. You're not going to build relationships with the community. You're not going to talk talk about what their issues are. You're not going to engage in a conversation as equals. You're just going to go there and say, "Come, come to us because we're right." I was like, "I don't think that's going to work." <laughs> like just from what I know about that neighborhood, people grew up in it. I'm like, I don't know if that's going to work. I don't know if that's how uh, to address uh, the contradictions among our class especially when it comes to race. And of course, it kind of, uh, well, it, it kind of, it, it failed. So I learned a lot from that in that, like, you know, I needed to find a way to talk about class struggle that took into account the very particular contradictions of the United States, its society, its imperialist system. I started to read Huey Newton upon a request, uh, uh, I mean, a a suggestion of a former teacher in high school that didn't teach me, but he was a photographer as well. And he was in SDS and he was in the civil rights movement, quote unquote, and hung around with like black power folks. And he was just like, damn, it really sounds like you need to read and study uh, those who 
were radicalizing on the basis of race and class. So I started doing that. And it did really actually help me understand the situation a lot better. Because not only with people like Huey P. Newton and Asada Shakur talking about imperialism and capitalism from the perspective of the United States in a very clear way, and also a very personal way, so I could really synthesize my own experience and see, okay, where do I fit in this? But then they were also saying, okay, I was reading Mao, Lenin, uh, Marx, Engels, and I was like, okay, I got to read them too. And so that got me on a trajectory of reading these works and then trying to put them into uh, practice with my activism. So my last few years of school, I just kind of focused on political education, started a little group, was able to get people like Norman Finkelstein on my college campus, Dhruva bin Wahad on my college campus, and uh, really focused just, yeah, on imperialism. Uh, I, I tried to do things around the intervention in Libya, but unfortunately, the only Libyan students there were anti-Gaddafi and <laughs> a little bit pro-NATO. So that was awkward, uh, the people I was doing Palestine work with. But nonetheless... I was just trying to do some political education. I started writing for the school newspaper a lot. Eventually got kicked off the school newspaper because I wrote, and I kid you not, I wrote an article about education privatization. And that was seen as too controversial. And I was uh, kicked off. Before that, I was talking about race and it was just controversial to the readers to the point where I was like receiving threats. <laughs> but nonetheless, I... Uh, started my writing there. And then when I got back home to the Boston area, I was like going around organizations, trying to figure out where do I fit. And then eventually I started writing because I, I, didn't, I didn't really fit in a lot of the organizational work. I was working too much to be too involved because none of the jobs I was getting early on made any money. So I was working too much. And so I was like, I need to be involved still. And so I started writing and I, I gained this ability to write. I started submitting a Black Agenda report and I kind of weaved my writing into my schedule. So I, I started to build this skill of like, all right, if I'm going to write and work, I got to integrate my writing in my work. And so that's what I did for a long time. I found ways to do that. And, uh, I, you know, it helped me hone the skill of writing. I continue to read alongside. I always tell people if they want to write and they should read, they need to read consistently. They need to read different kinds of works. Don't just read articles. A lot of people just read headlines of articles. Well, I say, okay, read the whole article and then read different articles and then read books. Because if you don't read all sorts of different prose, you're not really going to find your own style. And I still struggle with that, right? Especially as time becomes more and more condensed and difficult to manage. So Anyway, that's what I started doing. I started submitting weekly to Black Agenda Report. Glenn Ford helped me out a bit. He was not the most vocal editor. He would say like, okay, this is not good work. This is good work. Here's how to improve a little bit. Here's how to organize your ideas. And then I would take that and then, you know, try to do better. And eventually it just worked and became consistent. And yeah, that, that kind of, that's kind of how it happened. Uh, and I got really politicized by events like the U.S. NATO bombing of Libya, which helped me find Black Agenda Report and then helped me kind of focus my study on liberation movements, on anti-imperialism, on Marxism-Leninism. And so I feel lucky in this era where there's all kinds of debates about socialism, Marxism-Leninism, that I feel lucky to – I feel – to, I mean, I feel lucky to have been able to, in a moment where that wasn't happening, to kind of take from all sorts of different trends, tendencies, et cetera, and try to build a, I don't know, a dialectical materialist philosophy and lens to take into account, yeah, all of the contradictions and to then take firm positions based on those, regardless of the consequences. And then, of course, you know, as the years have gone on, you know, I did a lot of work on the U.S. war on Syria as an activist. I did some writing on it. Black Lives Matter was hugely influential. Then I wrote this book on American exceptionalism because of all that was happening with Russiagate and the Clinton uh, campaign of 2016. 
Sanders and all of that was happening. And I was like, wow, we really need to talk about this ideology because it's preventing us from moving forward. And then, of course, the new Cold War on China, on Russia went to fever pitch. And I've been focusing a lot of my attention on that because I was able to go to China. I was able to to really engage with a lot of anti-imperialist forces around the world who were doing this work. And, and I just see this struggle as, as so important as, and as something that people don't talk about enough. So that's in sum a little bit about how I got where I got. That's how I'm here right now. And, you know, I go through my ups and downs and, you know, I think all of us are struggling with a lot, but I am truly grateful for all of the support that I've received over the years and that I continue to receive and it's growing. And I feel like people, um, you know, a lot of people are spreading my work and find it very helpful for them in a very genuine way. And I think a very applicable way. And, you know, I, I, I try my best to help out organizations. I won't, you know, I, I think eventually I'm going to join one, but I've always gone through ups and downs with uh, organizational work, but I, I seriously uh, try my best to make things available to promote good work in the movement and uh yeah and, and to through my writing and through my analysis help organizations help movements help activists uh, get to the places where they want to go where i can't tell them or guide them or tell anyone all i can do is provide a, a, a sort of a picture of what's going on so that we can all together figure out what's the best uh, trajectory from here and you know continue to argue and demand that socialism right real revolutionary socialism be on the agenda while taking into account the material reality and giving a real attention to it so that's me in a little bit of a nutshell it's not a lot 